the opportunity to come back uh, to uh, another close reach group. I've presented some of this material uh, at the user group session, and some of it will we'll move a little quickly through because uh, I'd like to really get to the demo and show you how we're using Qualiware via CVP to uh, get at that cost of quality and so on. So, um, so here's kind of the agenda for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm going to fill you in on what a, what a DTO is, if you haven't heard of that. We'll talk about the methodology uh, to kind of enable a DTO model, which is business process analysis and costing. Uh, and then how together uh, they can monitor and optimize total quality, uh, total cost of quality, and we'll use a CBP uh, as, a, as the application that, that brings this all together. And then we'll talk a bit more about CBP and how, how that's configured, how typical users interact, uh, interact with that. So I said I'd do a little intro. Um, so Landmark Decisions, um, been around, uh, what's that now, 20, uh, 20, 29 years, oh boy. Uh, I'm based here in Halifax. My partner, Derek Sanderson, who uh, actually made a little intro earlier, uh, is based in Toronto. And we've been working for uh, at least that amount of time, uh, probably a little earlier in the, in the private sector, uh, in working with managers and C-level executives on, on helping them better understand their business through operational modeling, workload analysis, uh, doing costing profitability analysis. Uh, we do a lot of work in performance management as well, which is actually where I met, uh, met Kevin uh, a number of years ago, um, scorecarding, dashboards, and so on. And we've always believed that, you know, kind of technology enablement is, is needed in this regard. So, yes, we work in the area of methodology and content development, but we're firm believers that we need uh, technology to kind of make this real. Uh, we do some uh, research and we work with other organizations like uh, CAMI, uh, Consortium for Advanced Management, based in the U.S., member-driven research organization. We also do a lot of uh, training and partnering with uh, CPA Canada, many of the provincial CPA organizations, FMI. Some of your finance folks in the federal department may know, uh, know about FMI. Um, and uh, about three or four years ago, we, we partnered with uh, Bob Bover, who's also on this call, uh, who kind of owns and manages CBP software, uh, Kevin and the Close Reach team, and Qualiware to conceptualize and bring this solution to bear. And uh, we're very pleased to be continuing to work with Close Reach on that. So, so both Derek and I have uh, many years, uh, many years' experience implementing these methodologies. Um, the technology we're using today and we'll be showing you today is, is, is relatively new, um, but we have had experience implementing that with other technologies over the years. So, although we think CVP is the best now for sure. So what is a digital twin? Um, some of you probably have heard that term. Uh, it was originally coined by a fellow at uh, University of Michigan, Dr. Michael Greaves, who uh, discussed it as a, a virtual representation of the elements and the dynamics of, of how business processes work within an, in an organization. So it, it's more than a framework. It's, it's more than a schematic. It's certainly more than just digital automation. It's really an interactive virtual representation of how business processes work. Um, it was really popularized in probably 2010 when NASA started using digital twins for spacecraft simulations. Um, some of that as a result of, of the Challenger and other space shuttle disasters more, more appropriately. Um, and in the last five years, it's become quite popular now with the advent of what's called Industry 4.0 which is kind of the fourth industrial revolution, really focused more on manufacturing, granted, but that brings in things like interconnectivity, Internet of Things, information transparency, AI, machine learning, all of those concepts. So Gartner, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with Gartner, uh, one of the leading IT research consulting firms. So they, they've, they've been talking about DT for a number of years, and in 2017, they actually coined this term called digital twin of an organization, a broader view of digital twin as opposed to being focused strictly in, in manufacturing and scaling this up to kind of the enterprise level. So it was added to what's called the, the Gardner hype cycle for emerging technologies in, in that year in 2017. And then in 2020, uh, the, the DTO 
messaging really got strengthened through the work that they do in their market guides for technologies. Uh, and that's actually when we came across this one last July. Uh, this came out in July 2021. Um, and when we read that, we said that's exactly what we do with CBP, with BPAC and CBP. So it's a dynamic software model. That's what we execute through the Qualiware platform with CBP that brings operational contextual data together into this business model that represents the organization or business processes. So it can be enterprise wide or you can scale this down to a specific business process. How we connect with current state, i.e. existing data, uh, both operational and financial data, and then how do we use that to respond to change, to play scenarios, understand how resources are deployed in the delivery of customer value. So uh, we were we were pretty thrilled with that uh, that definition. Uh, we probably couldn't have said it better ourselves. There is another one, uh, AI multiple. Uh, have another one. I, I, we like this one too because it talks about you know business leaders getting involved in understanding the process and analyzing and tweaking those processes in a digital you know virtual uh, environment. So saving time, energy, uh, waste associated with testing it out in the real world. Uh, which sometimes doesn't drive the benefits that you expect to be able to test it uh, virtually uh, first and run these simulations and so on. So those are those are all key things to ours, what we talk about at DTO. In that report that Gartner had uh, about the market uh, technologies, they kind of position um, DTO coming across uh, these five different kind of domains. So you have your destination, that's, you know, kind of your your roadmap, your your future future state and goals. Your 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 map is kind of how you're going to get there. Your current processes, uh, you measure those those processes and be aware of the situations where the roadblocks, where the obstacles are going to occur in your journey. This is very much a kind of a a, a travel uh, an analogy. Um, and then the value. What 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 business decisions are you making with this information to drive value for your customers? So BPAC as a methodology cuts across all five of those, um, those uh, components. And then from a technology point of view, down here, this bottom part talks about the technology. So you, all of you are very familiar with, with enterprise architecture tools, and you can see that plays strongly in these first two areas. Uh, then it kind of broadens out into enterprise business process analysis, enterprise performance management, and business analytics. And that's really what we bring to the equation. So if you look at the definitions Gardner has of these, you know, it's around modeling, it's around understanding resources, around tying those out to products and services. And then in the business performance management, it's around capturing metrics, performance metrics, service metrics, financial metrics. Uh, operational metrics, how you do scenario testing or scenario playing or scenario planning. A lot of people use different different terms for that, uh, but then bring those analytic results from those scenarios to drive down costs and improve value in the organization. So CBP goes squarely after these two silos and these, uh, I'd say we, uh, we, we, we border into into this area when we look at the definition of but we're a strong player in this area here. So we really consider ourselves to be kind of a, a DTO technology. Um, and so let me let me share with you what we mean by BPAC. So business process analysis and costing. So it really is a three legged stool. It talks about process optimization. So uh, Carol in his introduction talked about lean and yes, we do incorporate lean concepts and lean tools. So uh, we, we help lean practitioners and sort of quantifying uh, what they can deliver with some of the lean uh, initiatives that they undertake with, uh, with, with their clients and their organizations. Uh, we do process modeling and as a result, we can do what if and scenario playing analysis. We focus also on resource optimization. That is really key because basically your ability to execute, to deliver service, deliver products to your customers is bounded by the constraints in your business, you know, the facilities, the equipment, the people. So understanding that and how those resources are used is, is, is very key to uh, service and, and product delivery. 
And then last uh, part of that stool is the, uh, the cost optimization. And this actually ties nicely to the resource optimization, because if you think about it, this is where your, your dollars exist in an organization. So if you can track how your resources are being deployed, you can actually look at your, your costs down to your products and services and customers. And then we can do the traceability, both of fixed and variable costs. And when we talk about cost of quality, what we can do then is, is tag activities and tag uh, resources that are dedicated to cost and compliance in the organization and, and tally those up. So I hope that that's what I'm going to be able to show you in that, uh, in that demo. So we say big package sits at the intersection of this, uh, this kind of three-legged stool uh, by integrating these optimization techniques and uh, deploying that through this mo modeling technology called CVP. Uh, and it really stimulates a multidisciplinary collaboration. So we get people, it's not just operations people, it's uh, finance people, it's planning people, it's sales and marketing if you're in the private sector, everybody having the same song sheet around how the business, how the digital twin of your business is operating. And then current tools that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the stack, I'll say. Uh, so we do lean value stream mapping. We probably won't spend so much time on that today. Uh, Activity-based planning, that is the resource management side of, of, of what BPAC does uh, and how we bring the, that modeling together. And I'll talk a little later about you know, how, we, how we work with, uh, with clients in, in deploying this. So really BPAC is the foundational piece for creating the digital twin of the organization. Um, some of you may have seen these slides. I'll go through these quickly. I just want to position a little bit about uh, kind of how Lean and, and EBP fit together. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with Lean anyways. Uh, I mean, quality is a, is a big component, a big target of Lean because it's all about improving value for the clients. Uh, and it's removing waste or eliminating leading waste and improving quality. So it really changes your perspective on uh, what's often called the, uh, the iron triangle, uh, in that it can actually help you reduce costs, how you can speed up time to delivery in your lead times of either service delivery or product delivery, and increase the quality. We like to think about it as capacity as well, increasing the capacity in the organization to be able to service the client better, to produce more product, more service, be more responsive, and so on. So that's what, that's what Lean is really all about. So value stream mapping is, a, is one of the key tools of, of, of a lean implementation. And it really goes after kind of the lead time. So if you think of a service standard in an organization, uh, and many of you in the, in the uh, federal uh, sector would have that, uh, a lot of them are related to time. So uh, from a time a request comes in to the time you deliver, uh, deliver the service. So when you look at a process, so this is actually some work from Health Canada a number of years ago, um, where they go and they do site visits, they handle queries as a result of inefficiencies in getting the site visit and the information done properly when they did the site visit. And then they produce reports or uh, approvals and compliances and so on. So when we look at um, activities, we can actually start classifying activities, um, value and non-value added, and we can also say, hey, is that a non-value added, is that a cost, cost of quality activity? And in this case, the info queries that we have here would definitely be a non-value added activity, i.e. if you did it right the first time when you did the site visit, you wouldn't have to handle the query. Uh, and this can be considered a, uh, a cost of quality because there's a bit of a rework that takes place in this. So when you do your value stream, what you're looking at is your total service delivery time. And again, I'm not going into too many of the details, but that's really broken into three areas. Your elapsed time, the time from the time you start the activity to the next, uh, the processing time, how long does it actually take it? Hands-on time, think of it that way. And then you have the real killer in most uh, processes, which is the wait time. That's the time when you know there's this dead time between activities, typically when uh, an activity is being done by maybe another area or another, uh, another business unit, and there's the, the, the gap time uh, in, be, in between until till it's picked up and moved along through the process. And in this case, we obviously see that they're not meeting their, their service standard. So some of the 
performance metrics that come out of lean value stream mapping are what's called the value added ratio. So that gives you an indication of, of your processing time, your real hands on time compared to your total lead time. You know, what percentage is actually, uh, you know, being, I'll call it effective. In this case is 6%. Um, so that's a, that's a, Pretty low number. Uh, good numbers are uh, really no, probably no higher than than 40 or 50 percent. So uh, it's a good indicator to track, especially when you're looking at performance improvement, as far as cycle time and and, and lead times and so on. How you can uh, how you can manage that. So these are all kind of service delivery metrics. So we use that construct, that process flow construct, with activity-based planning. Activity-based planning. Uh, was uh, kind of popularized through this work at CAMI, uh, the Consortium for Advanced Management in this publication they did. Actually, my colleague Derek online here is one of the co-authors of, uh, of that book. Uh, so if you wanted a, a deeper dive beyond what you're getting in ABP here today, you can certainly, uh, certainly uh, order that up or uh, let us know. We can, uh, we can give you some details on that. But here we have that same process looking at time to serve. What ABP goes after is the operational of the capacity and the costing associated with that process. And again, I'm, I'm going to blow through this one pretty quick because I've got another one that relates more appropriately to the demo we're going to go through. But basically, customer demands, you know, the, the outputs of that process are doing inspections and doing assessments. So that drives the work, the, the activities and the activities themselves consume resources. So when you look at your labor force, when you look at your facilities, when you look at your equipment, when you look at external uh, resources, so fixed uh, variable resource of, of contractors who, who are basically outsourced to do the, uh, do the reporting. So we look at this causal relationships from demands or outputs, activities or processes and resources. And that's really what we pay for. When we calculate the model though, so we actually run the data through it. The data that we bring in is operational information, such as the volumes of your, of your output for a specific time period. We look at how much activity do you need to, to support a particular output. We look at how much resource is necessary to do that uh, particular activity. In this case, that processing time that you saw from the value stream map is actually the same number that we would use here. And that's where we start to make the interconnections between value stream mapping and activity-based planning. And all of this can actually then determine what your, your uh, total utilization is because usually most of your fixed resources, we use this symbology to represent fixed resources. So our calculation from the bottom up will allow us to determine how well are we using those resources? Um, and are we <laughs> expected to overutilize those resources? Well, that could be important information too when you start talking about planning and forecasting. So uh, it does have a, have a tie into, uh, into that, that world of uh, budgeting as, as well, because what we can do is we can bring in financial information. So understanding capacity to serve, back to our little uh, triangle, um, but now we can actually bring in financial information. So we can map our expense structure, our GL, our, our chart of accounts to the resource structure. And now we can pull the dollars back down through this model because we've already established what the flows are from the, I'll call it the first pass from the bottom up. So we know how to distribute the dollars back down so we can get at the, the cost of all of our activities, including the cost of quality related activities. In this case, the rework associated with not doing the site visits properly. And then we can get our cost of our outputs and we can even take this down to the cost of the customer based on the uh, selection of, of services or products that uh, the customer requires from us. So that's ABP. I'm going to come back. I've got another slide to talk about that. So um, BPAC really is the merger of ABP principles around building flows and understanding a visual representation of your, of your business, tying it to resource and identifying where those constraints and being able to do what if analysis. I'll show you this with the tool. And then lean, how do we identify and eliminate waste? How do we reduce our lead times, uh, provide more customer uh, value? 
uh, and then build this organization of a, a culture of continuous improvement where, where people are all sharing common information and coming up with ideas to around to improve things. So BPAC really brings those two together and it really enhances both the lean and the ABP by combining those, those techniques. So what is total cost of quality? Um, it's, it's typically defined as a, it's a financial metric, uh, a cost, but it's really driven by operational issues. Not unlike what we have with an ABP diagram, the costs of an output, the cost of a customer or whatever, are really driven by how the business operates. So the operational information is, is, is so critical on that. So when we look at total cost quality, it's usually broken into two pieces. The cost of poor quality, which, is usually defined as the internal failure cost, so scrap, rework, uh, downgrading of product as a, as a result of uh, uh, not meeting certain specifications, product expiring, particularly in the food industry, unplanned downtime. These are all things that enhance, or not enhance, but actually increase cost uh, in the organization and the things that we'd obviously want to, uh, want to minimize. More expensive even than those are the external failure costs. So the things that escape out of the uh, the factory floor or out of the out of the business and have to be returned, and you're dealing with customer satisfaction and complaints and recalls and warranty charges and ultimately loss of reputation and, and, and lost opportunities. So these can all mount up to significant costs. So what are some of the ways we try to control that? We do that through looking at the cost of good quality. So these are the things that we should be doing in terms of appraisal costs. So uh, testing, uh, making sure our, our production areas are, are calibrated, working properly, uh, doing quality audits, uh, compliance audits, uh, making sure you have the documentation, all of that, we call it appraisal costs. And then prevention costs. So things like training, providing better education, understanding on people, let's say, on the, on, the, on the floor, as it were, doing risk assessment, preventative maintenance to prevent breakdowns and unplanned downtime and so on, uh, failure mode and effects analysis. All of these things kind of play into the whole realm of cost of quality and total cost of quality. Um, the ones that are bolded here are ones that we'll actually be talking about in the demo. Uh, and I would actually say, I, I, I'm going to add a, a, a DTO plug here that I, I think building DTO models and being able to run simulations is actually a great prevention cost because now you can simulate the impact of any of these other ones, as we'll see, uh, and uh, provide more uh, insights into what can be done to control those through scenario planning and simulations. Um, so basically, DTO model provides that ability to monitor and optimize this total call cost of quality. So I'm going to show you a demo, um, but just before we jump in and kind of maybe bewilder you in CBP, I just thought I'd explain some of the concepts uh, of what CBP does. So we represent, we have some, some pretty basic, what we call primary modeling objects. We, we talk about variable resources. We talk about fixed resources, and these are the symbols we use. We have activities, summaries, those describe our business processes. And we have this thing at the bottom we call demands, which are really, in this case, products. Uh, in a uh, public sector environment, they would be the services that would be provided as well. Uh, we do have this uh, little purple dot here. I'll, I'll show you what that is, and that's just a connector to allow us to bring larger models, uh, multi-page models together and, and provide connections, uh, both physical connections from the, uh, an algorithm point of view, as well as visual connections. So again, same idea, the resources requirements start by understanding the volumes of the product. So in this case, they have a, this is a, a dry, what's called dry pack ink. So it's a dry packaging good. So think of anything like uh, your uh, oatmeal cereal, Quaker Oats, uh, Jello products, uh, drink products, uh, hot chocolate, anything that's kind of pouched and then cased and put in cartons or cases and so on. This is really what this is uh, this is describing. So typically we'll have what's called a, a summary that allows us to bring in different components associated with, in this case, this product being uh, produced. Uh, and the main part is filling the pouches. 
So uh, when a pouch runs down along the production line, then the raw material uh, goes into the pouch, the pouch is sealed, then it, off it goes for case backing and pallet and shipping and all of that stuff. But the real core of the production is, is filling that pouch. So we might need to know, obviously, how big is this? How many pouches do we have for the case? And then we need to know what resources are necessary. So we need a production line uh, to fill the pouches. So we then need to know how many machine hours to fill a pouch. So that is really related to the production rate of that particular product on that particular line. Here's where we would use connectors. So wherever that line one is used elsewhere in the model, not on this page maybe, uh, for another product or whatever, we would make that connection. So we have one resource um, that is shared across maybe a variety of products. We also have an operator. So that operator has to monitor the machine. Uh, so we're actually looking at the production speed as well will dictate how many labor hours of oversight is, is necessary during the, the production. And they too can have a, a, a connector like that. There's raw materials that come in. So the pouches themselves, they're, they're, they're typically called what's called a web roll. They come on these, these big, uh, uh, they're probably, I've got my hands out in front of me here. You can't see it. They're probably about three or four feet uh, in diameter. Uh, may contain anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 pouches on a roll. Uh, and so there's material cost that goes in there. Obviously, there would be product related costs like the raw materials and so on as well. This is just an illustration, so I'm kind of trying to keep it simple. Um, web roll changes. So when this roll runs out, they actually typically have to stop the line. They have to put in a, another web roll and restart the line. So we could consider that definitely a non-value add activity. Uh, it's definitely something has to be done. It's certainly nothing that the customer really want to pay for because it's not adding value to the product. Um, so it becomes a target for optimization. And we can, we can do, I'm just going to use a little red, uh, red line around here to identify things that are considered non-value add activity. And that can have significant cost because what it does is it prevents the line from running, you know, real product. It has to be down and it takes time to do this as well because the people have to do that. In fact, in this case, two operators have to do that. So if a web roll change takes 15 minutes, it's going to take 30 minutes of operator time to do that. And then that's important both from both a process efficiency point of view as well as a costing point of view. Another non-value add activity to clear changeovers. So when this line moves from product A to product B, uh, typically is a shutdown, there are reconfiguration, depending on the speeds and products and, and so on. So again, that takes time away from the overall capacity of the, of the production line. Uh, and uh, that's what's called typically the, the setup times. And we see we make a connection here now between the line one operators and, and the time they spend. And again, both of the operators have to get involved in that changeover. So that becomes a, 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 an opportunity area there. We could reduce the number of changeovers. Uh, so we could run longer product runs or reduce the time of a changeover. We would have a, 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 an impact on, um, on efficiency and ultimately reducing costs. And then we have rework. Uh, so I describe this as a uh, as a cost of quality activity. Um, so that one's uh, I would call part of the internal failure cost, and hence that that color. I do do use a lot of color here, uh, and you'll see that also in the CPP model. So those pouches that uh, misform in the line. Uh, maybe the line was running too quick, the operator wasn't paying attention, uh, what have you. They have to be taken off. They have to be, uh, typically will be opened up the raw material inside. They, they can be maybe salvaged and, and, and rerun through, but you'll lose the, uh, the pouch itself. And you'll lose all of the other resources that went into creating the pouch in the first place. And that's a really key thing when you look at cost of quality, because that one really is a true cost of quality, a cost of poor quality. So they'll typically uh, manufacturing organizations will measure their amount of rework and uh, we, can, we can model that in. And that becomes important because the more rework that's done, the more pouches have to be filled. 
uh, we have to account for that uh, waste that happens in, in, in the process. And that requires time too, because an operator has to tear this open, recycle the materials, move that back into the feeder bin and, and so on. So there's an extra cost. It's not just the cost of producing it, it's the extra handling cost. So when we go at cost to quality, we're getting a very good resolution around those, uh, those costs. So capacity, all of this runs up. It, it, it bounces off the how many hours of production line do you have available? How many operators and, and how much, how long is a shift? So we can actually monitor the utilization depending on the speeds and the volume of product that needs to be produced. Um, and then if we can run this model that we don't get any broken constraints, and we'll show you that in the, uh, in the demo, uh, we can actually now pull our dollars back down because the costs sit at the resource. So what's the cost of production line? So depreciation, maintenance, uh, square footage that's taken up in the uh, facility itself. Um, those are all costs here. The web roll cost would be the, the, how much does it cost to buy in that, uh, that web roll? Those can be hundreds of dollars, uh, thousands of dollars, depending on the, the graphics that are on those, uh, on those pouches. The line operators, uh, not just necessarily how much you're paying them on an hourly basis, but all the support requirements that they may have, you know, training, uniforms, uh, supervisory uh, above that and so on. So we, we can actually start looking at, at, at things like, you know, the cost per pouch, uh, but probably more importantly, looking at the fully loaded costs of the production line and the fully loaded costs of the operators. So, and then that gets pulled back down so we can actually get at what is the cost of a web roll change of a changeover of a pouch rework. And if I look at this pouch rework, it's really not just the cost of the wasted pouch, it's the cost of the operator time to deal with that rework, but it's also the cost of filling that pouch, uh, which includes the web roll change. So it, it gets weighted based on how the process works. So that cost, a rework cost, is probably higher than anybody realizes. And that raises the magnitude and the importance of managing quality and managing the cost of quality. Um, I'm just gonna skip over that. Those, these are just some of the uh, sample currents. We'll make this uh, deck available to anybody that's interested in that, uh, we, can, uh, we can do that. So that's my cue to kind of jump into a quick demo here. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly involved uh, um, model. So we probably won't have time today to go through all the uh, idiosyncrasies, more than happy to go into deep, deeper detail with anyone who's, uh, who's interested at a later point. So, but you'll see we do take uh, good use of, of, of color. Apologies if you have our, uh, any of you are color challenged. Uh, we've tried to keep uh, kind of faithful to what you saw on the slide there with regards to the types of, of um, quality costs. So prevention, appraisals, internal failure, external failure. And I'm also highlighting non-value added costs as well. So uh, mo many of these are, would be considered non-value add as well. So uh, again, at a high level, this is our kind of our labor, our resource page. Again, we'll have time to go into all the details. I know a number, number of you have seen CVP before and there's some, uh, some resources uh, online. Uh, I'll share with you that uh, if you want to lear learn a bit more about it. But basically you have you know, a facility, they're housing a, a, a labor team. So the management team who oversees maintenance uh, that do maintenance repairs and preventative maintenance. Um, they oversee the quality uh, assurance labor group. So uh, they develop customer specs. So you'll see how they're used elsewhere. So these are these connectors that I talked about. The warehouse, uh, they handle some shipping and receiving. They also uh, do materials movement throughout the plant. So you'll see, you'll see warehouse labor being used down below here. Uh, they handle actually do some special packaging. So some customers require special uh, wrapping, uh, special packaging in the pallets that they do. So there's extra activity. Uh, which would consider value add from a, uh, from a customer perspective, but there's gonna be a cost associated with that. We have a sales team that again manages the customer and the customer orders. The real heart of the operation here is right here though, and these are the operators. 
and the packers. So each of these lines has an operator and then they have manual pack case packing and pallet palletizing and shipment and things like that. So we can uh, we can capture all that. If you go in and you're looking at any of the uh, the costs here, so for example, I went in and looked at the management team. This is where we layer in our financials. So we can pull in the management salaries, the management benefits. Um, I won't again probably have enough time to talk about uh, how we handle a lot of formulas and so on. But we can actually make these. This is a monthly model. We can make these models annual, quarterly, monthly. Uh, could go down as low as perhaps a shift level if you want to look at capacities and, and, and costs on a shift by shift basis and so on. So your time frame is a selection that you make when you're developing the data that supports this, uh, this kind of DTO model. Um, so when we go down here and I look at the operators, uh, we have, uh, this is actually where we do use a, a what we call variables. So these little uh, green Vs that you'll see throughout are variables and those can be used in uh, various formulas. So the number of operators here, uh, which is 10.3, uh, uh, basically that will dictate how, many, how much cost there is based on the average hourly rate and how many shifts are being need, needed to, to produce the X number of products and can also be used in the uh, in the capacity. So there's a little formula editor here that allows us to bring different data points together, do some do some calculations and uh, effect uh, basically things like capacity and, and financials. We have some shift parameters here. Basically, this operation is a 12 hour shift. The practical capacity, however, of the, the people on those shifts is only 10 and a half hours. We have to give them a lunch. We have to give them some breaks. So we want to net out and look at practical capacity when we when we do our modeling. So if I go down to the next layer, this is the production lines themselves. Uh, so there's there's basically two lines. There's uh, line one, line two, and line two actually has a specialized piece of equipment called a cartoner. So line one products basically go from pouch to case. Line two products go from pouch to carton to case. So if you think of uh, hot chocolate, for example, when you go to, uh, to go to your favorite grocery store, you're picking up typically a carton. It may have seven, it may have 10 different pouches of, of hot chocolate, uh, but they're shipped then in a, in a larger case. In bulk shipment, you go to Costco, it may be a different, different story. You may not get the carton, you may just get uh, 50 pouches in a, in a big box. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the differentiation here. We have different operators. Uh, so we have line one operators and line two operators. We have line one packers and line two packers. And they can work overtime. So we can actually use that and flex that. And the case, actually the base case that we have here, we've got a number of operator overtime hours that's already been, and the, the cost of that will certainly be higher than the, the average uh, um, that pay typically at time and a half. So we're able to account for, for things like that. Um, we can actually bring in the number of, of production days. We, that, that actually dictates the capacity of the equipment because the equipment's available, you know, uh, I'll say 24 hours a day, less preventive maintenance and downtimes and so on. Uh, but it's the, the plant's decision as to how it wants to staff that line. So the capacity between your lines and between your, your operators running those lines may be quite different. So we can capture that. And here you start to see some, of, sorry, I should have gone back up here and pointed out. So we've got a prevention cost here. This is the scenario that we're gonna run. So doing operator training, what would the impact of doing better training? Remember that was a prevention cost. Uh, preventative maintenance is a prevention cost that, uh, that uh, we, can, we can monitor and actually add to the cost of. And here's the production line itself. So this is just for product 1A. So raw materials come into the production area. They go through the pouch filling, the case packing, the palletizing, and then they move out as finished goods back out to the warehouse. So that's kind of the, the main process. And then you've got a variety of other supporting things. So you've got run paperwork. So that's all the documentation. So we call that you know, appraisal cost. Uh, we've got changeovers when this product needs to be started up or stopped and things like that. that's a, a pure non-value added cost. So, and same thing as role change. So I've got this little red border around here to signal that. 
Um, if I come along here, here's that pouch rework we looked at before. So that's a, an internal failure cost, as, as our breakdowns. So poor PM may cause more breakdowns. Poor understanding of the equipment may cause more breakdowns. So we want to be able to tally these costs. And you can actually see these, these dollars here. This bottle's been calculated now. We can actually see the total cost for L1A breakdowns in this month was $4,600. And you can see the cost of pouch rework, $8,700. Well, I can see it, maybe you, depending on how good your eyesight is. So when we start to look at tallying these costs, we can actually say, what's the total cost of, of uh, internal failures? I can add those two together. Uh, and I could now, I could say, what's my cost, my appraisal cost, my documentation work. Here's some product testing. So the QA team, the QA labor, uh, is involved in testing the raw materials and testing finished products as is coming off the line. So that would be considered another appraisal cost. And as we go across, we can look at here's here's the line uh, product B for line one, and here's product A for line two. This is the one that has the cartoner. So we actually see there's another little uh, component in that in that step process. Uh, which also has some rework. So, you know, the cost, the cost of quality issues are higher here uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which has got an extra step involved as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of the production lines. And then we bring this all together. Uh, so we can, we can look at this from a customer or a product point of view. This is the customer view. So basically a customer one, two, and three, they order a different mix of these different products. They have different support requirements. Um, and uh, you can manage all of these. And again, we won't have time today to get into all the, the detail, but you can manage all of these with variables uh, and, and change your product mix, your pricing mix. Your uh, We also have then the, the return. So there's another external failure cost. So product gets out, uh, that is not to, not the to standard, uh, at least in the customer's mind. Uh, it could be product that expires, didn't get out there quick enough and the customer sends it back in the case of food. Um, so we have customer returns. So that is, that's a, another significant cost, so, you know, $7,600 here, uh, $36,000 here because the product L2A, the complexities of that product. Uh, and the handling of that product when it comes back can be higher. So we can actually capture uh, all of that. So the scenario I wanted to run with you, if we look at here, we're looking at our total revenue, about a million dollars, uh, $1.1 million. We have a total cost of, uh, you know, not too much different. So a pretty low margin for this month in operating for this number of customer orders and so on. So when they look at the total cost of quality, uh, they sort of recognize that more preventative cost, quality, uh, good quality, would potentially help there. So we can actually run that. So we can, the storyline goes here. What if we did operated training? Let's run um, half, uh, every week we're going to run, take half the shift and we're going to do the operator training. Uh, help them on better understand the equipment, better understand the product, and let's see what we anticipate the impact of that would be. So the first thing we want to do is say, we're going to have to run four sessions this month, one, one per week. So I'm going to change that to four. And what this will now do is drive up the four, the amount of training time. And who's delivering the training? It's the supervisor that's delivering the training. The operators are receiving the training. If I run that model, you'll see as soon as I make a data change, all of my numbers disappear because I have to recalculate this model. And I recalculate it in two steps. I calculate finance, uh, operationally and it says, oh, you've got a problem. You've exceeded some capacity because we do not have enough supervisors and we don't have enough operators to keep the lines running and go to do the training. So we need to resolve that. If we're really committed to this training, okay, we may have to hire another supervisor so we can basically institute training on a regular basis. So I could run that again. I can see that I've solved that problem, but I still have my operator problem. So I'm not getting any financial calculations until I resolve all my broken constraints. So I am basically going to say, okay, I need to basically add some more people onto each of these shifts for the operator so they can keep the line running while some of them are getting trained. So to do that, to simulate that, I'm just going to take this up from 2, two to 2.5 2 
operators for each of the lines, so 2 to 2.5. And now let me run that again. And if I go back up now, I see it says, oh, operational successful. I've got no broken constraints, which it allows me to run the financials. So now it's pulling the dollars back down. And I can see, hey, I've lost profit. Uh, yeah, you have because you've hired a new supervisor and you put more people on the line. So you've, you've lost about $20,000 to do that on a monthly basis. What's the benefit going to be? Are you going to see that benefit in, uh, in costs? So some of the benefits that could have been anticipated perhaps by doing this training, this would be the business case maybe that was presented, is that, hey, could we increase the, uh, the uh, production speed? So uh, yeah, we can probably run these, these machines a little faster. So I can go from 100 to 110 cases per hour. That maybe allows me to increase the run size. By doing that, I will have less changeovers. Uh, so that'll have a positive impact. Maybe I can optimize the way I do my changeovers. Maybe they don't take 30 minutes anymore. I can take them down to 15 minutes. Uh, breakdowns. I'm, I'm now, my operators are more knowledgeable about the equipment. They're anticipating. They're, you know, before it breaks down, they're able to make adjustments and so on. So maybe I can actually reduce the uh, number of, of uh, breakdowns that take place. I'll take that down. Let's say I just take that down to, uh, to, to half of that. So uh, I'll have one one uh, half breakdown for every thousand cases that are produced. And then my rework. So maybe a lot of the problems we had in rework, again, inattentive, un lack of understanding, maybe I could, if I could reduce my rework by, by, uh, by, by 2% two, by, uh, 2 or, or half that from 4% to 2%. So I can do that. I could go and I could make these changes uh, across the other production lines. Uh, based on the benefits, and I, you know, this product was the real, I call it the dog product because it had a lot of rework and so on. So I could actually see what the impacts of that would be, and then I could recalculate that model. So, and I could actually understand now, I'm not only done partial, partial of the serum, just conscious of our time here. So I could rerun that model and I could actually then compare what these costs are. What's going to happen in this case, because I've actually uh, sped things up, I will have actually seen a decrease in the utilization of my resources. So I may not need all of the shifts that I'm running here today uh, to produce that volume of product. So I could actually back off on my number of shifts, which would then generate some cost savings. So, but I could also then tag all of these costs and see what these costs are. So we actually do it from a functional point of view with the tool itself. When you open any one of these up, we have what we call a flag, and we can basically tag any activity. So we can call this one an internal failure cost. It's also a non-value added cost. It's also a type of rework. So if I wanted to sum up all of my reworks, I can do this. So I can do the analytics, and that's where I want to take you next, because the tool allows us basically we can actually export our what I call detailed results. So all of the information that's here i mean if i look at you know what what we have um, at any point in the model i can see all of the resources that flow into product l1a how much of each resource what the cost of each of those are i can see this on a financial basis so the they keep the uh, they keep the finance folks so this is all split and divided and recombined or whatever on an individual account basis so I can get an expense statement for any of these activities. So if I wanted to go and look at this uh, pouch rework, there's what's going in to that pouch rework cost of $4,800. Uh, and there's the resources that are, are flowing and the activities that are flowing into that. So I get a real understanding now of what, not just the dollar value, but what are the component costs of that. And then I can reflect this so I can output that and I can come at this with some dashboards. So this is, uh, I use Power BI, you could be using Cognos, you could be using Tableau, uh, basically take the normalized uh, results data set and do some analysis. So if you want to do, you know, profitability analysis and do comparisons and resource requirements by customer, by product order, you can actually see all of those things change. Um, and if I go to looking at, you know, utilizations, how well am I using my people? How well am I using my equipment? All of that information is available. I'm just going to jump down to this total, quantum, total 
uh, cost of quality analysis. So I've got two scenarios. The one I was starting to do with you, this one where we do training only. Uh, the base case, my total cost of quality is $240,000 out of a total of $1.13 uh, million. That's a lot of quality related stuff. So a lot of that is coming out of internal failures. Okay. And we can actually see the segmentation so I can actually select it. This, this shows me all the resource, so that $143,000, here's where it's all coming from. Here's where those costs are all coming from. Certainly I can go back into the model and investigate that further, but this is kind of a summary uh, of that information. So if I wanna look at the next one, external failures, so I click on external failures and this will show me all of the costs associated with the external failures. And these ones show me my cost contribution. So basically, uh, for external failures, for customer three orders, a total cost of $28.51 a case, $1.76 is related to external failures. If I compare that to internal failures, it's $3.81. So I get my total costs, I get my component costs, I can see which ones are prevention. And if I look at now, I've already ran this scenario, obviously, to create this dashboard, but if I look at my total cost prevention here, $24,000, and 12,000, so I've got not a lot of costs of my good, you know, good quality, costs of good quality, but I'm paying the price in the cost of bad quality. So if I do things better, I invest here and, and invest here, if I look at my, my finished S4 scenario, say, hey, yeah, I'm gonna have to basically spend some more in prevention, it went up to 42,000, but look at the benefits that I've got on my internal and external failures. If I flip back and forth and things like that, so 239, down to 131. So, you know, we've saved, uh, saved over $100,000. And that includes the money that we have invested for that for that training package. So anyways, hopefully that gives you an idea kind of how the tool uh, and VPAC and CBP work. Uh, just going to jump back to the presentation here just to finish off quickly. So in summary, uh, basically, CVP allows us to can bring disparate information, organizational data, and provide key actionable insight. By building this digital twin, the organizational structure of your business, and we do that through a, a DT model in our CVP cloud hosted by, hosted by Closereach, um, and we can bring in organizational data. So your process data, your HR data, because that impacts on both our costs and our, our labor capacities, our GLs and our financial, we can load that in to the model based on the structure of the model that's been built. And from that, we can actually get visualizations, we can get the ability to do simulations, and we can get strategic dashboards. Uh, that give us better insights into uh, how our business operates. And this is kind of what the, the management team would be working with. These are what the analysts would be working with. And just to summarize that, uh, so how we go about that, basically business process owners would work with CBP modelers, people that understand kind of the QualiWare CBP platform to build these, uh, oops, sorry, to build these models. Uh, data suppliers can extract uh, the information from operational and financial systems, help build that in. That's all done around the design of these models. So now you've got your structure with your data that you can then calculate, and then you can do some analysis and simulation. So your business process owners or your analysts can be running scenarios, looking at optimization, looking at ways to reduce the uh, poor cost of poor quality, maybe through enhancing the, the cost of, of, uh, of good quality. And then that information we pushed out to executives and uh, they can consume that information with dashboards and then provide feedback and guidance to run maybe additional simulations to look at different ways to uh, structure the business, uh, both for you know, current state and, and future state. 